Cool. All right. Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Uh, here today with your co-hosts, Lisa and Venkat. Venkat, how's it going today? Good. So, Lisa, you've been through a week of terrible, awful things in Texas, right? What's going on? Uh, well, nothing's going on today. Today it's a great 68 degrees and sunny outside, but um, last week it got down below freezing for a number of days. Uh, we lost power. Uh, the freeze affected the power grid. Um, we had a lot of problems with generation supply, so power went down for, I think, 30 to 50 percent of Texans were without power for a couple of hours, maybe days last week. Um, yep. In the coldest weather we've really had in like the last 30 years um so yeah uh it was a very interesting week of survival yeah and i think uh, yeah before we get to our letter of the day which is n and we're going to be talking about nfts and the N nine cat uh, i did want to like also ask you about gritty because i remember in the first season at some point we talked about electric power generation and how you were like uh gaming the Texas like free market to mine Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. oh. And looks like you kind of had a good escape out of the other end this time, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, um, so I think before I can kind of give you tell you the gritty story, I should probably give you some context about the Texas energy market, um, where it's deregulated. Uh, typically, we tend to have lower energy prices than most places in the United States. Um, I think average is about 10 to 12 kilowatt cents per kilowatt hour. Um, part of the reason, part of the way that they do that is there's a, um, it's considered like part of the deregulation is that there's a market. And so people who make energy sell it at the market-based prices and it's supposed to go up and down on demand. So sometimes the generation prices can be negative. So you can get paid money to burn electricity. Um, and sometimes it gets really expensive when there's a crunch, like not enough supply to meet demand. Uh, so the prices will go up pretty high. Um, there's a cap on nine dollars per kilowatt hour is the Texas like the it's like basically the mandated maximum. Um, so that's kind of how it works. Most of the so then since it's deregulated, there's a bunch of little companies that you can shop around and find which ones have different rate plans. Um, some of them have a fixed rate. So you cut sign a contract, you're on a contract for a year and you pay a flat 12 cents per kilowatt hour for the whole year. Um, some of them are variable, so they go up and down, kind of depending on how much the company wants to charge you. Um, I was using a pretty special one called Gritty. The way Gritty works is they sell you the spot price. So they actually sell you the five minute um, price that is being charged in the wholesale market. Uh, and it's, they've got a really cute app. You can log in and see what the current grid price is and kind of what they're predicting it'll be for the next 24, 36 hours. Um, they charge you $10 a month to use their service. So you just pay them $10 a month and then you pay for whatever the energy price is. And usually you can save some money doing this. Um, I typically would pay seven to eight cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and when prices go down overnight, they get down to like two cents per kilowatt hour. I'm paying like, um, it averages out to about six cents. Anyways, so that's like, anyways, so. Um, so what, what, like people think more easily in monthly electric bills, I think. So what was your typical monthly bill and what is it in a regular thing? Mm, I have to look it up. Uh, I don't really pay attention to the monthly thing. It's kind of high <laughs> because I, I, sp I think I use about 1100 kilowatt hours during the winter, um, up to like 2500 kilowatt hours in the summer when I've got AC going. Um, and so my energy bill is usually about like 140, 150 to okay. And, and I think that's uh, about what I'd expect for a townhouse. But so I would imagine that for your square footage and level of usage, if you're going somewhere between two to seven cents a kilowatt hour and the average person is like 10 to 12, then you'll on average be saving like 20 to maybe 50%. Yeah, well, others, right? it's a little complicated because your bill split in half, like half of my bill is, or there's a base rate that I have to pay that doesn't go to buy the energy that goes to the energy transmission uh, company. Mm -hmm. And that's about four cents a kilowatt hour. So when the prices of the pump, so to speak, when the electricity price is two cents, my actual rate is about six cents. So the fact that I average out to seven or eight cents kilowatt hour means that on average, I'm paying two to three cents actually for the, um, 
oh, and the okay. energy itself. Oh, okay. So it's usually really, really low. It's cheap. And sometimes when it goes negative, I get to, I get the advantage of that, right? Um, and that's nice because like like we're talking about, I mine crypto in my garage. Not a lot. I have like, you know, a couple of small machines, but um that means that my, you know, get paid to run my miners when the when the price goes negative. Anyways, uh, we had this huge problem last week. And so basically all of last week, at least four or five days, the energy prices were pegged to the highest cap to $9 a kilowatt hour. So if you stayed on gritty uh, for what energy you could burn, you were spending like a thousand times what you normally would spend, more than a thousand times what you would normally spend. Uh, so people are getting energy bills that are in the thousands, tens, well, tens of thousands of dollars. I don't really understand. You'd have to be spending a lot of energy to hit $10,000, but like, I ran some numbers and like, yeah, I could see how you got an 8K bill over a few days, um, over a week running at $9 a kilowatt hour and like keeping your house at the same, whatever. Um, how did I escape this? Because I did escape it. Um, the nice thing is about being on a dere deregulated thing is that you can switch power providers anytime you want. So I figured out last Friday that the Gritty's prices started going up the Thursday before we got the storm. So about four days before the storm hit, because it hit like Sunday night, um, at least in Houston, I think Austin might've gotten it earlier. Anyways, prices started going up and I kind of looked at it and looked at the tea leaf, read the tea leaf, so to speak, and bailed to a fixed rate plan, a monthly fixed rate plan. Um, so it changes every month, but um, it's nine, it's a pegged at nine cents a kilowatt hour. So it's only a slightly more expensive than I was paying on Gritty but uh, I won't get, I'm not subjected to the $9 kilowatt So hours. this is what uh, I think, um, I'm, I'm having a hard time sympathizing with people who got the huge bills because they kind of knew what they were getting into. I mean, it's a free market and you sign up for like a wholesale spot price service and you kind of celebrate when you save a lot of money, but then you should expect like any other investor that you'll be hit by events like this, right? So I'm- yeah. As my whole issue is that so there's the public utility commission or whatever that sets the price on the market artificially kept it at nine dollars and nine dollars a kilowatt hour for like a couple days like i was looking at i was looking at some you can look at the demand so the demand the supply demand charts are all public so you can go and look and see how the supply demand of the texas energy grid is doing in real time which is pretty cool um and I went and looked at it and I was like, why are the prices? Because even during the night, they were still $9 a kilowatt hour. And that's just like, it, during the night, it should drop down because it's not, we weren't hitting like peak. It wasn't like maxing out. I was looking at it and apparently the PUC, Public Utility Commission, kept, like artificially kept the prices up. And so to me, I'm like, that's like gouging. Like the, <laughs> the you know, they're like, they're like, oh, well, we should like make sure these like companies aren't gouging them. At the end of the day, it was the utility commission themselves that were doing the gouging because they weren't allowing the, the market wasn't fluctuating with supply and demand. Like they were keeping it high because they were hoping supply would come online. But in the absence of supply, raising prices artificially is gouging. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm sure there'll be like a huge postmortem, just like with the same thing happened in California like a decade ago, right? So it's going to be not... Or, whenever, two decades ago, whenever it happened in California. And yeah. uh, it led to huge amounts of reform and stuff. So I imagine that'll happen and Ted Cruz hopefully will lose the election <laughs> for running away to Cancun. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's a sort of great segue point for uh, talking crypto, right? Because just kind of like crazy price variations and stuff and nine cat the internet sensation got sold for what 300 ether so that was what something like 660 at the time it was 600 it's close to 600k i think it's come down a bit yeah. since then since the ETH price is down today specifically but yeah so our our topic today we're doing letter n right um and for uh nfts uh, or n for nyan cat um i think nfts is kind of the overarching thing though mm -hmm. um so I guess this is mostly going to be a Lisa Explains Things episode, huh? Um, and me interrupting with rude questions. Okay, so what's an NFT? Okay, yeah. So an N NFT stands for non-fungible token. And let me explain exactly what that means, right? Um, so 
fungibility is basically the idea that if I have a dollar bill and you have a dollar bill, we can exchange the dollar bill and we both still have a dollar and it's all the same. So dollar bills in and of themselves are fungible. Non-fungible would be if I have a painting of the Mona Lisa and you have a painting of the Nyan cat hanging on your wall. And if we exchange paintings, even if let's say they're the exact same look, yeah, well, they're not, it's clearly not the same look, but the same size on canvas, paint on canvas, and we exchange them, um, we have materially changed, exchanged something very different, right? So it's non, it's non-fungible. So non-fungible tokens on Ethereum, which is where most of these tokens are being minted. There are some other blockchains that have NFTs that isn't Ethereum, but Ethereum is the one that's mostly in the news, mostly. Um, Anyway, the, these are tokens, so they're, they're tokens, but there's only one of them and each one represents a unique thing that you can trade then because it's on the blockchain. Uh, so the nice thing about NFTs, so why would you, why would you want one of these? Um, a big thing with like artwork or in the art world is um, kind of proof of ownership or proof of authenticity or ability to track kind of the ownership of the object and the blockchain tracks ownership really, really well. It's one thing that blockchains are really good for is a public making public records of ownership and public records of history of ownership. So creating an object that has this links to a um, so and if so the big thing right now in NFTs is digital artists in particular, taking a piece of art that they've made going to um, people have made like contracts on Ethereum where you can, I'm not exactly sure how the process works. I should probably do it just so I know kind of how it works exactly. This is the but ERC you, um, 720 or something standard that you're talking about, right? So I don't not I the old, know. It's yeah. not, is it ERC 720 maybe? That sounds yeah, that's the one. Uh, oh, okay. like, I think back in 2017 at that boom, everybody was talking about ERC 20 tokens, but that's like fungible tokens, like your own private currency. But yep. this is the non-fungible one, the 720s. Right. Yeah. So everyone you mint is independent and different, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyways, so you mint one on the chain and then it has, it's a token and it has its own history log, right? And I'm not exactly sure anyways, but you somehow you include the digital artwork piece or reference to it in the chain in Ethereum. And then, you know, you can add like author information or that kind of stuff. I'm sure that some of these platforms have written different contracts, different like protocols that hold different information and have different ways that you can track ownership and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so people have been, now have created art marketplaces where you can buy an NFT that shows up in your wallet and you, because it's crypto, you're the only one who has the right to change the record of it on the blockchain, right? And so when you sell it, you're basically selling the right to change ownership again, to sell it again, which sounds weird. Yeah. Um, but people can see so that just to be clear, the this is something owns it. Um, so it's created an art marketplace for digital art for like kind of the first time. Yeah, though I was confused about one thing that uh, looking it up, I kind of, I think I got clarity now that it's just the, it's like the equivalent of a title. It doesn't actually extend to like control or um, some sort of imprint on the object itself. Like um, you know, one of, I think both of us have met him, John Palmer, he's, he was at one of the refactor camps. He did an NFT token called Essay and he used it to like sell his essay and, I he made a token, that, right? That was yeah, like he made a token. token. Yeah, a 720 token, like a proper one. And uh, in the in his case, I'm not quite sure how the non-fungibility works, but everybody who bought, bought the token gets their name listed on the essay itself. So he's oh. kind of like created that artificial bridge. Uh, but in general, it's like you buy it and it's like a title, but the work itself, it could be public domain. It could move around. It's just a way for... Uh, the author or the owner to get credit. And in the case of like John's essay, I think he gets like a fraction every time it's traded or something. So there's like a, almost a transaction fee you impose on changing ownership. So it's yeah. a way, if you, if you make a very popular artwork and it trades hands and appreciates continuously, I think you make money on every transaction. So 
It depends on the contract that you locked it into, but yeah, there are, and I think this is the, the more popular ones are written such that when you create the object, you have some way of every time it gets sold or the ownership gets transferred, whatever the transfer value is or whatever, you get a portion of it back. Yeah. yeah. So basically this is a way that artists or people can, yeah, artists can make money off of secondary sales, right? And you could in theory, I think, I haven't seen this done yet, but you could use it to actually create a paywall, right? Like a decentralized paywall, like the token might have like some sort of hash that it un unlocks the article and lets you read it kind of thing. Should be possible, I think. I, that would, I, I mean. Yeah, so only one person could read the article at a time because you had to be holding it. Yeah, or you can have like a hundred different non-fungible tokens associated with the article. So at any given time, hundred people have the right to read it, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, maybe to access your website doesn't necessarily prevent people from downloading it, right? So like NFTs kind of solve an interesting problem with them. Um, so I think someone's like, someone over Valentine's Day, so like two weeks ago, a week ago, um, had a whole thing where they, I don't know, there was some pretty digital rose that was like going up for auction. I think it sold for a decent chunk of change. And someone on Twitter had was like, you paid so much for this. I just went and like had a screenshot of them just going and downloading the image off the internet. And they're like, this thing you paid like $50,000 for, I now just have, it's like. Yeah, it may be an impossible problem to like completely secure, but you might be able to do something like only your private key can sort of uh, decrypt it. But then if somebody takes a screenshot, I mean, there's a limit to how much you can secure it. But that's true in a way of like even the Mona Lisa and other physical artifacts, right? Like a talented enough artist, artist could make a copy that, um, you know, non-expert would not be able to right? tell apart, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and this is why, but I think this kind of gets back to why the NFTs are so valuable is because for, especially for digital objects, they create this like non like public, publicly available, easy to look up and hard to like change, hard to modify record of who actually owns it. So everyone mm -hmm. can have it and everyone can see it and appreciate it, but there's only like one true owner and we can all go see who that is and someone can prove that they own it very easily. Yeah. Um, so that hasn't really existed for like, so our objects like real physical art objects also have the problem with counterfeiting, right? Um, in a way, NFTs are superior to physical objects because they do have this like embedded digital record that you can always verify the authenticity of an NFT work by looking at the history of the chain and checking who the original like coiner of it was. Wait, 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 wait. you're conflating two things now. You can verify the authenticity of the claim to ownership but not the work itself, right? Yeah, like, you uh, can verify who minted the original artwork. So uh, let's... Uh, the nine cat example. So that's digitally, it's a GIF file format thing, right? Yeah. So is there information embedded in that GIF that associates it with the token of the guy who bought it or something? No, but if okay. you want, no, if you, the guy who, so for some context about the Nyan cat, where are we talking about Nyan cat? Uh, a few days ago, the original author of Nyan cat GIF minted an NFT. So he created an account on Ethereum and his account, the author's, like the artist's account, minted the NFT. And then that, that with the Nyankat GIF, which like everyone and their mother have probably has a copy of the Nyankat GIF somewhere, right? Like there's clearly a zillion copies of them, but there's only one that exists on, um, I think Foundation app was the protocol that they use. Mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what the difference is between all the different NFT protocols are. So um but he so but the i think the important thing is the original artist of it person who made Nyan cat minted it and so he has an account on foundation you can go and see that it's actually him that minted it and so that is the um the authenticity because then he's yeah. part of the chain yeah okay so that proves that only the person who holds the token is the rightful owner but it, it does not sort of um like if I made an exact copy of the GIF he created, then you wouldn't be able to, there's no meaningful sort of sense of like one is the true original. So it's not the GIF file that's um, authentic and original and irreplaceable. It's the token proving ownership that's uh, authentic. Ownership token, exactly. Okay, yeah. 
Yeah. And I think this logic has been, is going to be extended to a lot of stuff. Like um, there's the startup uh, Materium uh, out of England, and they're extending this kind of like custodial logic to all objects. They're starting with gold. So you can like uh, prove your claim to like a piece of gold. And they, they want to do this for the whole world. Like um, uh, basically, yeah, ownership uh, stuff for everything. And this is like, I guess, yeah. a decentralized digital copyright office that's not run by any government. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Copyright is kind of. And how do these, um, I've also heard the hashtag DeFi, D E F I, so decentralized finance. DeFi. DeFi. Yeah, that's been yeah. Uh, used more and more. And I think it refers to the exchanges where this sort of thing happened. Right, so well, what's, is there something going on there? Like, are these decentralized exchanges like technically different from something like Coinbase? Yes, they are okay. different than Coinbase. Um, they are run by, uh, okay. They're contracts on Ethereum that, you know, has been run or minted or whatever that, uh, Wait, are we talking about DeFi or are we talking about DeFi decentralized exchanges, DEXs? Uh, I think DeFi is sort of the overall category of these sorts of decentralized mechanisms and decentralized exchanges are an example. Is that is my understanding correct? It's an example of a decentralized finance institution. Like Zora. Yes. Zora Dex. is, right? A DEX is a decentralized exchange, which is an example of decentralized finance. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was getting at. So something like Zora, where you can do these NFT tokens is an example of um, a DEX. No? Is Zora yes. an exchange? It's a DEX for NFTs. I hadn't really okay, thought of yeah. it that way. I've been thinking yeah. of the fungible token ones, which oh, is okay. basically yeah, like yeah. crypto exchanges, like where you go. Mm -hmm. So Uniswap is the one I've been thinking of. Um, yeah, yeah. They're a decentralized exchange for crypto tokens, for like not for ERC-20 tokens, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Uniswap is where <clears throat> you can buy things like the SA token of uh, John's. So it's right. Um, so I don't think. Wait, so I'm pretty sure SA. I'm pretty sure the SA token is a ERC twenty token. Oh, it's a twenty. Okay. Holding it because you can go to Uniswap and exchange for it, right? Like you can exchange yeah. stuff to get. Oh yeah, and it's not exactly non fungible because um, there's uh, more than one copy. So all of them are associated with a single SA. But it's like a hundred or whatever of those tokens right. are for he one essay. Okay. He, he like he issued a hundred essay tokens, and yeah, okay. he's probably going to issue the essay. Like, there's the token essay e s s a y, but then there's also the artifact of the actual article that he's writing. Right, that yeah. he's probably planning on turning into an NFT. So the ah, got it. Right, so the digital artifact will become its own non fungible token thing. And then everyone who helped fund the essay holds essay tokens, which are ERC 20 things. Gosh, okay. this is complicated. Um, a lot of things going on here. Yeah, one is like a title and the other is like uh, dollars to like uh, access the title. So right. uh, I think a good analogy might be there's a car owned by a rental company and the rental company holds the title but anybody can rent the car, right? So anybody with dollars is allowed to rent the car but yeah. the car company still owns it. So something like that is going on. So I yeah. think these things are going to get more and more complicated. Yes, because ownership is complicated. <laughs> I think yeah. that's like the truth of it. Um, I wanted to say like the company you're talking about, the one that's going to do the, um, they're trying to take like real world, real world objects and put them on the blockchain. It's going to run mm -hmm. into, I think, accounting is a really hard problem. I think that people see this with taxes, like, Taxes, tax accounting is the attempt to create a digital ledger because I mean, most of our software for accounting these days is like online, right? Like there's a lot of digital ledgers and it's an attempt to like create a record of your digital ledger, which is money, uh, but money movements aren't like tracked on, aren't natively tracked on any chain. You kind of have to like keep, you have to like enter and update into a system every time that your money changes. Like if I hand you $200 bank hat, then I have to like, write that down somewhere, I have to go up and do it. Like the act of handing you the money isn't naturally tracked, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like a lot, there's this huge opportunity for what exists in the digital reality, the digital realm of tracking the object to 
not reflect the reality of the physical world of where the money actually is, right? Yeah. Um, the nice thing about having things, so the really cool thing about NFTs is, is that the act of selling the object updates the record. They're like one and the same. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that solves like, uh, so there's actually several things going on. There's tracking ownership, then there is tracking the accounting of people legitimately getting paid for transfer of ownership. So accounting for like the current balance or something. And then there is a, a chain of custody as you might call it. So like in police evidence, uh, you know, you have crime scene evidence. So the chain of ever custody refers to the actual artifact. Then you've got sort of the chain of transactions and then you've got the chain of uh, legal ownership, which would be this. So there's like, yeah, multiple things going on. Uh, and for purely digital artifacts, some of those things can be combined. Like maybe even all three things can be combined. Like if it's uh, something that you might be able to like protect from screenshotting, like a very small string, like say, I don't know, a, a small photograph or something, then you tie it up in the token, you never show it to anybody. And in theory, it could be like a secret object whose ownership and payments and physical existence all are tied together, right? So that's yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But I think I think it's important to point out that the reason that digital art is such a good thing to put in NFTs is that it's digital. It's a digital good. Like it it exists and it lives totally in the virtual realm. And so that makes it like a completely great thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what else. Um... What are some more powerful sort of use cases for this? Because art is nice, but I'm always like, yeah, it's always one of those charter markets where, yeah, things that work with art, can it go to something else, right? So I'm yeah, trying to I think- mean, my uh, I mean, the joke I like to tell about not art, the, the irony of like art, the artist or the practice of selling art is that it's the, it's the most truly capitalistic object and consumption mm -hmm. market that exists. Um, like, it, because the supply is like usually one or like five, yep. maybe if it's a limited edition, whatever. Um, and it's literally like the demand is like a hundred percent, I'm going to call stimulated or simulated. Yeah. Um, like it's, it's completely like arbitrary amount of demand. Um, yeah. And there's no way yeah. to like, even talk about like, is the price right? So for an art object, by definition, it's on the edge of the economy. There's only one of it. And if somebody wants to pay like the entire economy's worth for it, you can't call it irrational. That's Actually, what that, it's worth then, yeah. yeah. And- uh, Art is literally looking, art, the like sale of art is literally like the search for creating a price, a value, like a, a dollar denomination for a value, for a value, yeah. like for an object, a valuable object. There's, like uh, price discovery, I, it's pure price discovery. Um, I have this uh, way of, thinking about it that I think you'll appreciate, but not many people seem to get it, is that there are things you value with money and there are things that value money. Like, you know, they are valuation events for money itself and art is sort of on that end of things. And uh, I wanted to share another uh, line there. So Brandon Hudgens, who I think both of us have met, he's um, with Unchanged Capital, uh, one of the crypto startups that we both know. And he had this line that uh, confusing price and or expecting price and value to be the same thing is sort of the source of a lot of misery. And I think that's exactly right. Like you kind of have to separate your expectations of price from your expectations of value. And uh, uh, I wrote uh, my last issue of the Breaking Smart newsletter. I was writing about the uh, uh, Mars rover and I called it a civilizational art project because I mean, how else are you gonna value something that you send off to Mars costs $2.7 billion. Nobody's ever, like you can't sell it. Like it's not a car that you can actually physically trade hands. And it's like, what is it worth? Who asked for it? Who's spending for it? And the only way I could meaningfully think of it is it's a one of a kind civilizational art project and it costs $2.7 billion. And that tells us what dollars are worth much more than it tells us what Mars rovers are worth. Yeah. This is why I get really upset when people try and put a price on like um, eradicating like homelessness or eradicating um, 
mm-hmm. like hunger in America because the dollars and cents like you can you can compute how much it costs to buy a meal and you can average how many people are going hungry and you can run all the numbers and stuff but at the end of the day the actual project the actual execution of the project to actually feed every american is going to be grossly larger than that right well, like, yeah i don't know why and, this is the same but it, i think people who go that route of like putting a a value on human life it's not that the impulse is wrong i mean you can't spend like the entire gdp of um, the us which is about 22 trillion dollars to save one life for example like that would never happen in practice but that just because the extreme doesn't work doesn't mean that it's a rationally priced good like the value of a human life is not the contribution to gdp plus 10% or something like that you might be able to value like you know a block of iron or copper that way but you can't value human beings that way and one of the things i think civilizations do is simply decide as a matter of like uh, boundary conditions and values that human lives are worth this much and because we are america we are going to spend this much to save any human life and china might have a different sort of valuation of an individual human life and so forth yeah um, i was actually so to bring this back to our original discussion of power here in america in texas um <laughs> I was talking to a friend yesterday, like a good friend, um, lifelong Texan also, I guess. Yeah. Anyways, he's lived in Texas a long time and he was like, you know, our power prices are lower than the rest of the nations by a decent amount off my understanding is like the amount we pay per kilowatt hour is decently lower. And the reason that it is that is we have this decentralized energy market, right? Um, but it seems like one of the downsides of paying less for power is that every five, 10 years or so, we have a power outage when it freezes here because like our, we're not investing enough money in power that they have the like, whatever, they don't, uh, they're not winterized. The plant isn't winterized or whatever. Yep. Um, so like, it seems like, you know, we've like decided that we'd rather have cheap power than like completely reliable power, um, which is kind of like putting a value on what you value, like, um, electricity delivery um should probably mention that like places like canada also have power outages whenever they get heavy blizzards because apparently you know keeping infrastructure up during cold times is just really hard um yeah. so it's not like we, can, read somewhere that, we pay 50 percent more for power we would have completely reliable power but it's an interesting point but but there's a little bit more to it so i know we're running out of time but i think this is an important point to add to the electricity discussion I read that one of the reasons Texas landed in the position, like if you look at the map of um, the economic map of the electric grid of the United States, it has three pieces. There's the Eastern United States, there's the Western United States, and there's Texas, like literally their physical boundaries. And the reason Texas kind of stayed out of like joining either the Eastern or Western is doing so would have required like at a technical level interoperability, including winterization conditions, like mm. Tennessee or some other state on the East would say, in order to connect up to our grid reliably, you kind of have to winterize your grid as well. Otherwise the two grids won't work well together. So part of the choice was, uh, think of it as like a leveraged risk bet. And I think this is the reason a lot of Texans are now getting shocked at the deal they've like consciously made, which is it's not just the fact that Texas is a hot state, which rarely gets cold weather. Mm. It's the fact that grid reliability is also a regional thing. So if you decide you're not going to winterize your grid uh, then you're also losing the opportunity to connect to neighboring states which do have more severe weather. And therefore you kind of have leveraged losses. So now you no longer have the reliability of a larger grid backing you up. So it's like, I, I think- I mean, the Texas okay. grid is pretty big, Venkat. It's as big as France, like- Yeah, okay. But remember, France doesn't have an independent grid either. All of the UE, uh, EU has, um, sort of a fairly interconnected grid. So when Germany has a power surplus due to wind, it trades power with uh, Spain, which has like solar power and stuff. So Europe is like a continent sized super grid in a way. So uh, yeah, so I mean, nation and state boundaries don't mean as much as like infrastructure boundaries in these things. But except in overall, Texas. yeah. And I think so long as you're comfortable with the deal you made, including the fallout when things don't go your way, you're fine. But if you ask for the free market when it's nice and sunny, but then immediately cry for the government to step in and be socialist when things don't go your way, then you're being a little bit of a hypocrite. And that is, I think, what's happening with a lot of Texans right now. It's like, 
okay, you enjoyed several years of like cheap, gritty power, and now this is happening. Yeah, modular customers, that's for sure. And I mean, uh, let's be honest, there was some market manipulation yeah, going on true, true. In, the, in the wholesale market. But... So, yeah, we should circle back to this when some of these sort of investigation is done and so forth. Um, yeah, I think um, I did want to share one more thing I saw on Twitter um, on NFT. Somebody said, uh, every, uh, you know, human beings are God's NFTs. So I thought that was a cute sentiment. It, it sort uh -huh. of speaks to that poverty line uh, you were talking about. And, and that's kind of um, interesting. Every human being is an art project that's like valued like an NFT and you shouldn't like think of it in rational market pricing ways. Anyway. Well, I mean, if you if you're gonna put it that way, then like every human is a process of like price discovery, right? Or value discovery is like part of it. And so yeah, the, the yeah, create yeah. your own value. And yeah, you, even if you're like uh, homeless and contributing nothing to society and like a drug addict or something, society might decide that you're worth a billion dollars and spend a billion dollars trying to save you, right? So yeah, that's what it means to be an NFT as a human. Yeah. All right. Cool. Okay. Well, Venkat, as always, it's a pleasure chatting and we'll catch you next week for what are we on? And oh. Oh, yeah. So we have to think of interesting things to talk about for O. It's going to be a big O episode next week, isn't it? <laughs> Complexity. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, let's see if we can do something. Yeah, I, I like this finance um, thing we're on. So let's see if we can find a finance thing for O. All right. Sounds good. All right. Talk All to right. you later. Bye.